basically the last eight months of the pandemic has exposed all of the different inequalities in society and it's then amplified the more and coming on top of the last recession and the anger that that had created against inequality and austerity has created a really explosive situation and I think the Black Lives Matter protests were just a slight example, a small example of what's likely to happen. And I think that the question of women's inequality, the discrimination that women face in society and the oppression that they face generally is going to be an important part of that new explosive mix that we're seeing now. And when you think about it, even before the pandemic, there were a whole number of big uh, movements around uh, the world uh, by women against violence against women, on the question of sexual harassment, on the question of abortion and other issues. And in the last week in Poland, there's been a mass movement of women, but not just women, of other groups in society, which began because the government wanted to completely decriminalise, almost completely decriminalise abortion. About 96% of abortions now will be decriminalised by the ruling of the Constitutional Court. And that has caused a huge uh, uprising not just in Warsaw but in all the main cities around the country and what has happened is, is the abortion was the trigger but all of the other anger in society has coalesced around that issue including the government's handling of the pandemic so the pandemic is a very important feature of the new period and obviously all working class people are affected by the pandemic and by the economic consequences but there are some groups in society that are more affected than others young people black asian minority ethnic people and working class women in particular and just to give two figures to begin with women are one and a half times more likely than men to have lost their job to have been furloughed or to have quit their job because of covid and they're 50% more likely to have had their hours cut. And I'll say a bit more about that, but that is before the old furlough scheme came to an end yesterday and before the new lockdown happens on Thursday, which Johnson uh, announced uh, yesterday. And basically what has happened is that working class women have gone into this pandemic doubly disadvantaged in the case of uh, black and Asian and minority ethnic women trebly disadvantaged and then the pandemic has increased that disadvantage or the disadvantages that women face in society and to understand why that is the case and what we can actually do about it it is worth just very briefly turning to Frederick Engels who was Karl Marx's main collaborator and actually this month is the 200th anniversary of his birth so we're likely to hear quite a bit more about him but in 1884 he wrote a book called the origin of the family private property and the state and that became a very important book for uh, socialists and marxists um, historically because it was the first time that a socialist explained that the inequality that women face in society the discrimination they face is not something that's natural it hasn't always existed that it came about around about 10,000 years ago when societies first became divided into classes where you had uh, an economically dominant class, exploitive class that had control of private property of the means of producing wealth in society and you had a, a, a class that was exploited and as part of that process women literally became the private property of men within the family of the ruling class uh, in, 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 in society and their main role was to give birth to children who would be the heirs and would inherit the property in the private property in the, in the, in the future and on that basis women became discriminated and became second-class citizens in society as a whole and Engels explained how capitalism took those existing inequalities that women faced and use them for, their, for, for its own economic interests and as a consequence then continued that inequality. And he said that if, um, and this was the most important part about the book really, was that he said what could be done about it and he said that the, most the first thing that needed to be done was that women needed to be, uh, to come out of the uh, isolation of the home and, they, and into what he called public industry, into 
the workforce, that it, that way women would see that the problems that they faced in society were not their own individual problems, but they were collective problems and that they could do something collectively against it, fight collectively against it alongside of working class uh, uh, men. And obviously he was writing at a time when women of the ruling class or the capitalist class didn't go out to work. It was a sign of their wealth and a sign of their respectability that women stayed at home and they looked after the needs of their husband who went out into the factories, exploited the workers to make a profit. That wasn't the case for working class women. Most working class women did have to work. But once women got married, then in most cases, they no longer worked outside the home. And the main reason for that was that as far as capitalism was concerned, the main role of working class women in society was to look after the needs of the current generation of workers unpaid in the home and to give birth to and to bring up the next generation of workers who could be exploited uh, in, uh, in the factories. And in fact, capitalism used, the capitalists used that fact that that was considered as women's main role to then pay women lower wages when they did go out to work and to employ them on worse conditions. And if you look at the situation today, then it's clear that that first prerequisite that Engels laid out has actually been met. Before the pandemic, 75% of women with dependent children went out to work. And that's one of the highest proportions internationally. It's quite normal, it's quite common now for women with children, even very young children, to go out to work. But that's actually a huge change when you think that before the Second World War, only 10% of married women went out to work. So what is quite a brief period historically, there's been a really big uh, social revolution uh, has taken place, which has had a big effect obviously on women themselves and their attitudes. And it's had a big effect in society in general. But what it hasn't done is it hasn't co created equality and it certainly hasn't uh, uh, meant liberation for women. Women on average still earn £9,000 a year less than men. And Engels said there was another, a second prerequisite that was necessary if women's equality was going to be ended. And that is that all of that unpaid work that women did in the home should be socialised. So the childcare, the uh, what he called the drudgery of housework, the uh, looking after what capitalism considers the unproductive members of society. So the unemployed, the sick, the disabled, the elderly, all of that care should be the responsibility of society as a whole and should be provided by uh, the state. And it, if you look now at the situation, then that clearly hasn't happened. That second prerequisite hasn't been met. That because of struggles that working class people have waged in the past, then obviously some services have been provided by the state. But after years of austerity cuts and privatisation, then those services have been pushed back. And that is though the main reason why women working class women have gone into this uh, pandemic so much more uh, economically disadvantaged and why the pandemic is having such a big effect on them because despite all the huge changes that have taken place in society and have taken place in women's lives uh, it was still the case that before the pandemic women were carrying out 60 percent of the unpaid work that was carried out uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the home and it's true that at the beginning of lockdown, men were doing 22 minutes a day more <laughs> caring responsibility than they were before the pandemic. Nevertheless, women uh, were doing 60% more childcare than men. And when the schools were closed down, 70% of homeschooling was being carried out by women. And when you think that many of those women were also working either in uh, at home or, or uh, out at work, then it's no wonder that women have been feeling really stressed, really tired and, and actually incidents of uh, mental uh, health problems have increased quite uh, drastically amongst women from 11% to 27% during the pandemic. And now we've got a situation where the schools have gone back and Johnson is saying that they're not going to close in the lockdown on Thursday, although the uh, education unions are, are, are opposing that. But the schools went back 
you know, prematurely in September because there wasn't the test and trace uh, in, uh, in place. There weren't the safety measures uh, in place. Everybody knows that they had nothing to do with the fact that they were worried about kids' education or about their mental health, that the whole push to get kids back to school was because they wanted uh, people to get back into the workplaces so that they could make profits for the Tories' uh, big business uh, uh, friends. But even if the schools stay open, last week, half a million children were sent home from school because of the pandemic. And in most cases, if they're younger children, it will be women who will be expected to stay at home and to look after them. And, um, you know, one of our main demands is work or full pay, that if anybody is furloughed, if anybody has to uh, self-isolate, then they should be paid their full wage. And I think we also have to say that that has to be the case for any women or any parents who have to stay at home because schools are closed or because of childcare problems. They shouldn't be penalised. They shouldn't have to take unpaid leave or, or their normal uh, annual leave. That they should uh, be uh, have they should have uh, their normal wages if they have to do that, and obviously if they have to go back to work, they should also go back on the same conditions that they were working on before. And it isn't just the schools that is a problem. There's also the questions of nurseries and of uh, um, uh, care in, in in general, because even before the pandemic, excuse me. Even before the pandemic, there was a real shortage of affordable nurseries and childcare, but that's now got much worse. And the TUC reckons that up to 40% of parents with dependent children under 10 are really struggling to find the childcare that they need. And because the nurseries are not able to make a profit or not enough profit from their point of view, it's estimated that up to a quarter of nurseries could close within the next few weeks, could close by a Christmas. And you know, that would be a, a drastic situation. Well, actually, it's going to particularly hurt working class women because they're more likely to close in disadvantaged and poorer areas because in the richer areas, they can put their fees up and they know that the parents will be able to afford them. But that's not the case in uh, working class areas. And that is a disastrous situation, both for the women who depend on that childcare to be able to work and for the majority and almost overwhelming, I think it's something like 90% of for those who work in childcare are women and for those women who, who face uh, losing uh, their jobs. And the only solution to that would be to take the whole of the uh, childcare, the privatised childcare sector into public ownership and run it democratically um, under the control of the people who work in the industry and of the, of the users of the industry, exactly the same as the only way to solve the disastrous situation of the social care uh, situation would be from social care to be nationalised. And I think that both of those demands, nationalisation of childcare, nationalisation of social care, would get a real echo if there was a mass force at the moment that was putting them forward. Obviously we campaign, but we have quite a, a small voice, unfortunately. And I think it's absolutely scandalous that every time that Keir Starmer or any of the other Labour leaders have been put on the spot about nationalising care industry, they've been always refused uh, to, to put forward um, that demand. And the reality is, that unless there are going to be huge battles waged by workers in the workplaces, in the trade unions, then this could be the first post-war recession in which more women than men lose their jobs. And this, this social revolution, this movement of women into the workforce could come to an end and it could actually go into reverse. They're already talking about this being a pink recession because of the number of women that are losing their jobs and it's because of the childcare responsibilities that women have that they are mainly uh, concentrated in the low paid jobs, the part-time jobs, the insecure precarious uh, temporary jobs and it's those jobs that in the first three months of uh, the pandemic uh, were reduced by 70 percent and now you've got the double whammy of the original lockdown coming to an end, uh, sorry, the original uh, furlough coming to an end, the new lockdown happening uh, on Thursday, and it's inevitable in that situation that tens of thousands more women are gonna lose their job in hospitality, in retail, 
all of the sectors where the main job losses are going to take place are sectors where women are uh, uh, working. And in the article that was in Socialism Today, you know, we quoted this uh, report from the University of Sussex, which said that as a result of the pandemic, gender relations were going to go back to where they were in the 1950s. And we said, well, that's a bit of an exaggeration. And I still think that is an exaggeration. But nevertheless, unless there is a big struggle waged, women's uh, conditions could go back uh, a quite a, a long way. And unfortunately, uh, up until now, then the union leaders have not shown much of a fight. But one of the things that is really positive about the pandemic is the number of people who are joining unions and in particular the number of women that are joining trade unions. In fact, the biggest increases in union membership have been in sectors that employ women, so in education and social care in particular. And they're joining the unions not to be passive members, but to get active, to get stuck in, to, uh, to, 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 to fight back. And, you know, because we've had this social revolution, women no longer see themselves as a, as a, as a minority. They're certainly not a minority, they're the majority of the workforce. They don't see themselves as a temporary part of the workforce. They see themselves as permanent and they're going to fight. They're determined to fight to keep the jobs, the wages and the conditions that they have if they're given a lead. Um, and we have seen has some uh, important struggles. I mean, the very important struggle was the one of the Tower Hamlets. Uh, workers, mostly women, mostly Black Asian minority ethnic women, who were all sacked by the Labour Council and then re-employed on worse terms and conditions. And they put up a very determined fight uh, uh, against that situation. I think we're going to see more struggles like the, uh, the struggles of the, the nurses who felt that they had no choice but to organise independently from below because for, for the 15% wage rise, because their uh, union leaders were not prepared to fight. Many of the union leaders have now moved either to support in the 15% or something like it, but obviously the pressure will have to be kept up for them to uh, make sure that that comes uh, a, a reality. And in both of those sectors, in the local authority and in uh, the, the health service, obviously Unison is the main union. And so our campaign to get Hugo Pierre elected as the General Secretary of Unison is going to be a very important campaign, is a very important campaign for all low paid workers, but it's particularly an important campaign for low paid women workers. The pandemic has also shone a spotlight on what is effectively another pandemic, and that is domestic violence. Um, excuse me. Even in so-called normal times, two women are killed by their partners or ex-partners every week. And in lockdown, that went up to five women a week being killed. There was um, a programme on Panorama. I don't know if uh, people saw it, but they spoke to women who uh, were in violent relationships and abusive relationships. And 60% uh, said that the abuse had increased during uh, lockdown and 75% said that they, um, it was much more difficult for them to get away from the violence and abuse. We're going into another lockdown uh, uh, now and that combined with the fact that women will be losing their jobs, that they're having their hours drastically cut in a lot of cases will mean that you know many women will not have the economic means to actually leave uh, violent relationships apart from the problems that lockdown itself will uh, uh, bring and, and added to that of course is the question that there aren't sufficient refuges and there aren't, isn't sufficient housing uh, to house women who lead violent relationships and so the question of domestic violence and we can discuss this in the workshop but the, the question of domestic violence is so clearly linked to the economic questions of uh, wages, jobs and uh, public services fighting back against the cuts in, uh, in local authorities and I think that after a decade of uh, austerity, what the pandemic has done is basically it shattered any remaining ideas that there may have been that capitalism could offer a way forward for 
working class women. Now, it seems incredible, but when I started writing the book, It Doesn't Have to Be Like This, which was about 15 years ago, one of the main arguments that we were arguing against was that equality for women was just around the corner, that they just had to make a bit of an effort and, uh, you know, they'd be able to uh, get there. That's just been smashed to pieces. That idea has just been smashed to pieces. And when you get that huge disconnect between what women expect from society, what they want and what capitalism is actually able to offer, that's when you get a really explosive situation developing. It's when you get big struggles taking place. And it's also when people's ideas start to change very, very quickly. And I think that it's easier now than it was at any time, or recently anyway, to explain that socialism is the only way of ending all forms of equality and uh, oppression uh, in, in, in society. If you move away from a system where the economy is owned and controlled by a small, super rich minority that's only interested in making profits and replace that with, a, uh, with an economy which where the main industries are publicly owned, where they're democratically controlled by working class people and where you can plan, logically plan the resources in society, then that would immediately release the resources to improve uh, the situation for all working class people, but for working class women in particular, particularly the uh, economic situation, the economic disadvantages that they face, it would mean that we would immediately be able to introduce the shorter working week, which means that there would be more time for things like leisure, for uh, family, for relationships, for running society as well, for, uh, for democratically participating in the running of society. It would mean that everybody would be guaranteed uh, a job with a decent wage, which means that women then would be able to be economically uh, independent in the way that some are not uh, today. And it would also mean that we could do what Engels talked about all those years ago, that we would be able to socialise uh, the unpaid work that women uh, are carrying out in the home and it is making their situation so um, disadvantageous. It would mean that the state could provide um, quality, affordable childcare, it could provide social care, it could provide uh, communal restaurants, affordable communal restaurants, things that would make a huge difference to working class women's lives. As far as other issues are concerned, like domestic violence, like sexual harassment, um, like the sexism generally that women face uh, in society, then that would take a bit more time because those ideas, are, they go back thousands of years, you know, they're quite sort of rooted in, uh, in, in, in society. But if you have a situation where you no longer have gender inequality in the home and you have a situation where you no longer have gender inequality in the workplace, and you no longer have a privately owned media, you no longer have a privately owned uh, beauty industry, leisure industry, fashion industry, all the industries that, uh, you know, turn women into uh, commodities uh, to make a profit or promote, you know, certain stereotypes of women, the way that women should behave, the way that women should look or the way that men should behave and the way that men should look. If you do away with all of those things, then that would lay the basis, not just for ending the economic uh, um, inequality that women face, but also violence, the, the sexual and the cultural oppression that women face in society. And so just to finish, uh, I don't think there is really one aspect of society that hasn't been affected by the pandemic in some way. I think that it's intensifying, it's, it's speeding up all of the processes in society. And I think that struggles by working class women are going to be an important part of uh, those, uh, th those processes. But and, uh, we, can, we can discuss this further in the workshops, but if we're actually going to end capitalism, if we're going to bring about socialism, and if we're going to end all equality, injustice and oppression, then that will require a united struggle by working class women and working class men organised in a party that's got a programme and it's got a strategy for getting there.